from Gibbet Island, a legend of Communipaw. Whoever has visited the ancient and renowned village of Communipaw may have noticed an old stone building of most ruinous and sinister appearance. The doors and window shutters are ready to drop from their hinges. Old clothes are stuffed in the broken panes of glass, while legions of half-starved dogs prowl about the premises and rush out and bark at every passerby. For your beggarly house in a village is most apt to swarm with profligate and ill-conditioned dogs. What adds to the sinister appearance of this mansion is a tall frame in front, not a little resembling a gallows, and which looks as if waiting to accommodate some of the inhabitants with a well-merited airing. It is not a gallows, however, but an ancient signpost for this dwelling in the golden days of Communipaw was one of the most orderly and peaceful of village taverns, where all the public affairs of Communipaw were talked and smoked over. In fact, it was in this very tavern, this very building, that Olaf the Dreamer and his companions concerted that great voyage of discovery and colonization in which they explored Buttermilk Channel, were nearly shipwrecked in the Strait of Hellgate and finally landed in the island of Manhattan and founded that great city of New Amsterdam. Even after the province had been cruelly wrested from the sway of their high mightinesses, by the combined forces of the British and the Yankees, this tavern continued its ancient loyalty. It is true. The head of the Prince of Orange disappeared from the sign and a strange bird being painted over it with the explanatory legend of De Wild Gans, or the Wild Goose. But this, all the world knew to be a sly riddle of the landlord, the worthy Tunis Van Giesen, a knowing man in a small way who held a finger beside his nose and winked whenever people observed to study the signification of this sign. They observed that the goose was hatching and would join the flock whenever they flew over the water, an enigma which was the perpetual recreation and delight of the loyal but fat-headed burghers of Communipaw. Under the sway of this patriotic, though discreet and quiet publican, the tavern continued to flourish in primeval tranquility, and was the resort of all true-headed Nederlanders from all parts of Pavonia, who met here quietly and secretly to smoke and drink the downfall of Britain and Yankee and success to Admiral Van Tromp. <laughs> the only drawback on the comfort of the establishment was a nephew of mine host, a sister's son. Jan Joost Vanderscamp by name and a real scamp by nature. This unlucky whipster showed an early propensity to mischief, which he gratified in a small way by playing tricks upon the frequenters of the wild goose, putting gunpowder in their pipes or squibs in their pockets and astonishing them with an explosion while they sat nodding around the fireplace in the bar room. And if perchance a worthy burger from some distant part of Pavonia had lingered until dark over his potation, it was by odds but that young Vanderscamp would slip a briar under his horse's tail as he mounted and send him clattering along the road in neck or nothing style to his infinite astonishment and discomfiture. It may be wondered at that mine host of the wild goose did not turn such a graceless varlet out of doors. But Tunis Van Giesen was an easy-tempered man, and having no child of his own, looked upon his nephew with almost parental indulgence. His patience and good nature were doomed to be tried by another inmate of his mansion. This was a cross-grained curmudgeon of a negro named Pluto, who was a kind of enigma in Communipaw, where he came from, nobody knew. He was found one morning after a storm 
cast like a sea monster on the strand in front of the wild goose and lay there more dead than alive. The neighbors gathered round and speculated on this production of the deep, whether it were fish or flesh or a compound of both, commonly eclipsed a merman. The kind-hearted Tunis Van Giesen, seeing that he wore the human form, took him into his house and warmed him to life. By degrees, he showed signs of intelligence and even uttered sounds very much like language, but which no one in Communipa could understand. Some thought him a Negro just from Guinea who had either fallen overboard or escaped from a slave ship. Nothing, however, could ever draw from him any account of his origin. When questioned on the subject, he merely pointed to Gibbet Island, a small rocky islet which lies in the open bay, just opposite to Communipaw, as if that were his native place, though everybody knew it had never been inhabited. In the process of time, he acquired something of the Dutch language. That is to say, he learnt all his vocabulary of oaths and maledictions with just words sufficient to string them together. Thunder and blixem, thunder and lightning were the gentlest of his ejaculations. For years, he kept about the wild goose more like one of those familiar spirits or household goblins that we read of than like a human being. He acknowledged allegiance to no one, but performed various domestic offices, all without being ordered, grooming the horses, occasionally waiting on the guests, cutting wood, drawing water. Lay any command on him, and the stubborn sea urchin was sure to rebel. He was never so much at home, however, as when he was on the water, plying about in skiff or canoe, entirely alone fishing, crabbing, or grabbing for oysters, and would bring home quantities for the larder of the wild goose, which he would throw down on the kitchen floor with a growl. No wind nor weather deterred him from launching forth on his favorite element. Indeed, the wilder the weather, the more he seemed to enjoy it. If a storm was brewing, he was sure to put off from shore and would be seen far out in the bay, his light skiff dancing like a feather on the waves when sea and sky were all in a turmoil and the stoutest ships were fain to lower their sails. Sometimes, on such occasions, he would be absent for days together. How he weathered the tempests and how and where he subsisted, no one could divine. Nor did anyone venture to ask, for all had an almost superstitious awe of him. Some of the Communipa oystermen declared they had seen him more than once suddenly disappear, canoe and all, as if he plunged beneath the waves, and after a while come up again in quite another part of the bay, whence they concluded that he could live under water like that notable species of wild duck, commonly called the Hell Diver. All began to consider him in the light of a foul-weather bird like Mother Carey's chicken or Stormy Petrel, and whenever they saw him putting out on his skiff in cloudy weather, made up their minds for a storm. The only being for whom he seemed to have any liking was Jan Joost Vanderskamp, and he liked him for his very wickedness. He, in a manner, took the boy under his tutelage, prompted him to all kinds of mischief, aided him in every wild harem scarum freak until the lad became the complete scapegrace of the village, a pest to his uncle and to everyone else. Nor were his pranks confined to the land. He soon learned to accompany Pluto on the water. Together, these worthies would cruise about the broad bay and all the neighboring straits and rivers, poking around in skiffs and canoes, robbing the set nets of fishermen, landing on remote coasts, and laying waste orchards and watermelon patches. In short, carrying on a complete system of piracy on a small scale. Piloted by Pluto, the youthful Vanderskamp soon became acquainted with all the bays, rivers, creeks, and inlets of the watery world around him could navigate from the hook to spiting devil on the darkest night and learned to even set the terrors of Hellgate at defiance. At length, 
Negro and boy suddenly disappeared, and days and weeks elapsed, but no tidings of them. Some said they must have run away and gone to sea. Others jocosely hinted that old Pluto, being no other than his namesake in disguise, had spirited away the boy to the nether regions. All, however, agreed in one thing, that the village was well rid of them. In the process of time, the good Tunis Van Giesen slept with his fathers, and the tavern remained shut up, waiting for a claimant for the next heir was Jan Joost van der Skamp, and he had not been heard of for years. At length, one day, a boat was seen pulling for shore from a long, black, rakish-looking schooner that lay at anchor in the bay. The boat's crew seemed worthy of the craft from which they debarked. Never had such a set of noisy, roistering, swaggering varlets landed in peaceful communipaw. They were outlandish in garb and demeanor, and they were headed by a rough, bully ruffian with fiery whiskers, a copper nose, and a scar across his face. And a great flaunderish beaver slouched on one side of his head, in whom, to their dismay, the quiet inhabitants of Kampunipa recognized their early pest, Jan Joost van der Skap. The rear of this hopeful gang was brought up by old Pluto, who had lost an eye, grown grisly-headed, and looked more like a devil than ever. Vanderskamp renewed his acquaintance with the old burghers much against their will, and in a manner not at all to their taste. He slapped them familiarly on the back, gave them an iron grip of the hand, and was hail fellow well met. According to his own account, he had been all the world over, had made money by bags full, had ships in every sea, and now meant to turn the wild goose into a country seat, where he and his comrades, all rich from foreign parts, might enjoy themselves in the interval of their voyages. Sure enough, there was a, there was a little while where there was a complete metamorphose of the wild goose. From being a quiet, peaceful Dutch public house, it became a riotous, uproarious private dwelling, the complete rendezvous for the boisterous men of the seas, who came here to have what they called a blowout on dry land, and might be seen at all hours, lounging about the door, or lolling out of the windows, swearing among themselves, and cracking rough jokes on every passerby. The house was fitted up, too, in so strange a manner. Hammocks slung on the walls instead of bedsteads. Odd kinds of furniture of foreign fashion, bamboo couches and Spanish chairs, pistols, cutlasses, and blunderbusses suspended from every peg, silver crucifixes on the mantelpieces, silver candlesticks and porringers on the tables, contrasting oddly with the pewter and delfware of the original establishment, and the strange amusements of these sea monsters pitching Spanish dollars instead of quoits, firing blunderbusses out the window, shooting at a mark or at any unhappy dog or cat or pig or barn door fowl that might happen to come within reach. The only being who seemed to relish their rough waggery was old Pluto, mm. yet he led but a dog's life of it, for they practiced all kinds of manual jokes upon him, kicked him about like a football, shook him by his grisly mop of wool, and never spoke to him without coupling a curse by way of adjective to his name, and consigning him to the infernal regions. The old fellow, however, seemed to like them the better, the more they cursed him, and though his utmost expression of pleasure never amounted to more than a growl of a petted bear when his ears are rubbed. Old Pluto was the ministering spirit of the orgies at the Wild Goose, and such orgies as took place there, such drinking, singing, whooping, swearing, with an occasional interlude of quarreling and fighting. The noisier grew the revel, the more old Pluto plied the potations, until every guest would become as frantic in their merriment, smashing everything to pieces, and throwing the house out of the windows.
Sometimes, after a drinking bout, they sallied forth and scoured the village, to the dismay of the worthy burghers who gathered their women within doors and would have shut up the house. Vanderskamp, however, was not to be rebuffed. He insisted on renewing the acquaintance with his old neighbors and on introducing his friends, the merchants, to their families. Swore he was on the lookout for a wife and meant before he stopped to find husbands for all their daughters. So, will ye, nil ye, sociable as he was, swaggered about their best parlors with his hat on one side of his head, sat on the good wife's nicely waxed mahogany table, kicking his heels against the carved, polished legs, kissed and tussled the young vrows, and if they frowned or pouted, gave them a gold rosary or a sparkling cross to put them in good humor again. Sometimes nothing would satisfy him, but he must have some of his old neighbors to dinner at the Wild Goose. There was no refusing him, for he had got the complete upper hand of the community, and the peaceful burghers all stood in awe of him. But what a time would the quiet worthy men have among these rake hells who would delight to astound them with the most extravagant gunpowder tales, embroidered with all kinds of foreign oaths, clink the can with them, pledge them in deep potations, ball drinking songs in their ears, and occasionally fire pistols over their heads or under the table, and then laugh in their faces and ask them how they liked the smell of gunpowder. Thus, the little village of Communipaw for a time, like the unfortunate white possessed with devils, until Vanderskamp and his brother merchants would sail on another trading voyage, when the wild goose would be shut up and everything relapse into quiet, only to be disturbed by the next visitation. The mystery of all these proceedings gradually dawned upon the tardy intellects of Communipaw. These were the times of the notorious Captain Kidd, when the American harbors were the resorts of piratical adventures of all kinds, who, under pretext of mercantile voyages, scoured the West Indies, made plundering descents upon the Spanish main, visited even the remote Indian seas, and then came to dispose of their booty, have their revels, and fit out new expeditions in the English colonies. Vanderskamp, had served in this hopeful school, and having risen to importance among the buccaneers, had pitched upon his native village and early home as a quiet, out of the way, unsuspected place where he and his comrades, while anchored at New York, might have their feasts and concert their plans without molestation. At length, the attention of the British government was called to these piratical enterprises that were becoming so frequent and outrageous. Vigorous measures were taken to check and punish them. Several of the most noted freebooters were caught and executed, and three of Vanderskamp's chosen comrades, the most riotous swashbucklers of the wild goose, were hanged in chains on Gibbet Island in full sight of their favorite resort. As to Vanderskamp himself, he and his man Pluto again disappeared, and it was hoped by the people of Communipaw that he had fallen in some foreign brawl or had swung on some foreign gallows. For a time, therefore, the tranquility of the village was restored. The worthy Dutchmen once more smoked their pipes in peace, eyeing with particular complacency the old pests and terrors, the pirates, dangling and drying in the sun on Gibbet Island. This perfect calm was doomed to be ruffled. The fiery persecution of the pirates gradually subsided. Justice was satisfied with the examples that had been made, and there was no more talk of Captain Kidd or other heroes of like kidney. On a calm summer evening, a boat, somewhat heavily laden, was seen pulling into Communipaw. What was the surprise and disquiet of the inhabitants to see Jan Joost Vanderskamp seated at the helm and his man Pluto tugging at the oar? Vanderskamp, however, was an altered man. He brought home with him a wife 
who seemed to be a shrew and to have the upper hand of him. He no longer was the swaggering bully ruffian, but affected the regular merchant and talked of retiring from business and settling down quietly to pass the rest of his days in his native place. The Wild Goose Mansion was again opened, but with diminished splendor and no riot. It is true, Vanderskamp had frequent nautical visitors, but the sound of revelry was occasionally overheard in his house. But everything seemed to have been done under the rose, and old Pluto was the only servant that officiated at these orgies. The visitors, indeed, were by no means of the turbulent stamp of their predecessors, but quiet, mysterious traders, full of nods and winks and hieroglyphic signs, with whom, to use their cant phrase, everything was smug. <laughs> their ships came to anchor at night in the lower bay, and on private signal, Vanderskamp would launch his boat, and accompanied solely by his man Pluto, would make the mysterious visits. Sometimes, boats pulled in at night in front of the wild goose, and various articles of merchandise were landed in the dark and spirited away to nobody knew whither. One of the more curious of the inhabitants kept watch and caught a, caught a glimpse of the features of some of these night visitors by a casual glimpse of a lantern and declared that he recognized more than one of the freebooting frequenters of the wild goose in former times from whence he concluded that Vanderskamp was at his old game and that this mysterious merchandise was nothing more nor less than piratical plunder. The more charitable opinion was, however, that Vanderskamp and his comrades, having been driven from their old line of business by the oppressions of government, had resorted to smuggling to make both ends meet. Be that as it may, I now come to the extraordinary fact, which is the butt end of this story. It happened late one night that Jan Joost van der Skamp was returning across the broad bay in his light skiff, rowed by his man Pluto. He had been carousing on board of a vessel, newly arrived, and was somewhat obfuscated in intellect by the liquor he had imbibed. <laughs> It was a still, sultry night. A heavy mass of lurid clouds was rising in the west with the low muttering of distant thunder. Vanderskamp called on Pluto to pull lustily that they might get home before the gathering storm. The old Negro made no reply but shaped his course as to skirt the rocky shores of Gibbet Island. A faint creaking Overhead caused Vanderskamp to cast up his eyes when, to his horror, he beheld the bodies of his three pot companions and brothers in iniquity dangling in the moonlight, their rags fluttering, their chains creaking as they were slowly swung backward and forward in the rising breeze. What do you mean, you blockhead? cried Vanderskamp. By pulling so close to the island! I thought you'd be glad to see your old friends once more, growled the Negro. You were never afraid of a living man. What do you fear from the dead? <laughs> Who's afraid? hiccuped Vanderskamp, partly heated by liquor, partly nettled by the jeer of the Negro. <laughs> Who's afraid? Hang me, but I would be glad to see them once more, alive or dead, at the wild goose. <laughs> Come, my lads in the wind continued he, taking a draft and flourishing the bottle above his head. Here's a fair weather to you in the other world. <laughs> and if you should be walking the rounds tonight, odds fish, I'll be happy if you would drop in to supper. A dismal creaking was the only reply. The wind blew loud and shrill, and as it whistled around the gallows, and among the bones, sounded as if we're laughing and gibbering in the air. Old Pluto chuckled to himself and now pulled for home. The storm burst over the voyagers while they were yet far from shore. The rain fell in torrents. The thunder crashed and pealed, and the lightning kept up an incessant blaze. It was stark midnight before they landed at Communipa. Dripping 
and shivering, Vanderskamp crawled homeward. He was completely sobered by the storm, the water soaked from without, having diluted and cooled the liquor within. Arrived at the wild goose, he knocked timid, timidly and dubiously at the door, for he dreaded the reception he was to experience from his wife. He had reason to do so. She met him at the threshold in a precious ill humor. Is this a time, said she, to keep people out of their beds and to bring home company to turn the house upside down? <laughs> company, said Vanderskamp meekly. I have brought no company with me, wife. No, indeed. They've got here before you, but by your invitation. And blessed-looking company they are, truly. Vanderskamp's knees smote together. By the love of heaven, woman, where are they? Where? Why, in the blue room, upstairs, making themselves as much at home as if the house was their own. Vanderskamp made a desperate effort, scrambled up to the room, and threw open the door. Sure enough, there, at a table, on which burned a light as blue as brimstone, sat the three guests from Gibbet Island, with halters around their necks, and bobbing their cups together as if they were hobbernobbing, and trolling the old English freebooter's glee, since translated into English, for three merry lads be we, and three merry lads be we. I on the land, and thou on the sand, and Jack on the gallows tree. Vanderskamp saw and heard no more. Starting back with horror, he missed his footing on the landing place and fell from the top of the stairs to the bottom. He was taken up speechless, and either from the fall or the fright, was buried in the yard of the Little Dutch Church at Bergen on the following Sunday. From that day forward, the fate of the wild goose was sealed. It was pronounced a haunted house and avoided accordingly. No one inhabited it but Vanderskamp's shrew of a widow and old Pluto, and they were considered but little better than its hobgoblin visitors. Pluto grew more haggard and morose and looked more like an imp of darkness than a human being. He spoke to no one, but went about muttering to himself or, as some hinted, talking with the devil, though unseen was ever at his elbow. Now and then, he was seen pulling about the bay alone, in his skiff, in dark weather, or at the approach of nightfall. Nobody could tell why, unless on an errand to invite more guests from the gallows. Indeed, it was affirmed that the wild goose still continued to be a house of entertainment for such guests, and on stormy nights, the blue chamber was occasionally illuminated and sounds of diabolical merriment were overheard, mingling with the howling of the tempest. Some of these were treated as idle stories until on one such night, it was about the time of the equinox, there was a horrible uproar in the wild goose that could not be mistaken. It was not so much the sound of revelry, however, as strife with two or three piercing shrieks that pervaded every part of the village. Nevertheless, no one thought of hastening to the spot. On the contrary, the honest burghers of Communipaw drew their nightcaps over their ears and buried their heads under the bedclothes at the thoughts of Vanderskamp and his gallows companions. The next morning, some of the bolder and more curious undertook to reconnoiter. All was quiet and lifeless at the wild goose. The door yawned wide open and had evidently been open all night, for the storm had beaten into the house. Gathering more courage from the silence and apparent desertion, they gradually ventured over the threshold. The house had indeed the air of having been possessed by devils. Everything was topsy-turvy. Trunks had been broken open and chests of drawers and corner cupboards turned inside out, and it was in a time of general sack and pillage. But the most woeful sight was the widow of Jan Joost Vanderskamp extended a corpse on the floor of the blue chamber with marks of a deadly gripe on the windpipe. 
All now was conjecture and dismay at Communipa, and the disappearance of old Pluto, who was nowhere to be found, gave rise to all kinds of wild surmises. Some suggested that the Negro had been betrayed, had betrayed the house to some of Vanderskamp's buccaneering associates, and they had decamped together with the booty. Others surmised that the Negro was nothing more or less than a devil incarnate who had now accomplished his ends and made off with his dues. Events, however, vindicated the Negro from this last imputation. His skiff was picked up, drifting about the bay, bottom upward, as if wrecked in a tempest. And his body was found shortly afterward by some Communipaw fishermen, stranded among the rock rocks of Gibbet Island near the foot of the pirate's gallows. The fishermen shook their heads and observed that old Pluto had ventured once too often to invite guests from Gibbet Island. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I now invite Mr. David Goodwin, who will offer some insight and analysis on the story. Thank you everyone, everyone for coming out this evening. This is my uh, first time appearing at the Apple Tree House, and it's an honor to be speaking in front of you in this wonderful, beautiful historic home. It's appropriate that we're hearing, or we heard, a ghost story in what was a funeral home in one of its past lives. <laughs> and I'm not going to attempt uh, to compete with that dramatic reading, but what I'm going to do this evening is place Washington Irving in a greater context and flesh out Irving's deep and rich history with Jersey City and New Jersey. And then I'm going to segue into discussing guests from Gibbet Island a little bit. So Washington Irving was born on April 3rd, uh, 1803 in, excuse me, 1783 in New York City, right across the river into a strict Presbyterian family of Scotch descent, not Dutch, which might be a surprise to many of us. Uh, the, the week he was born was the same week in which New Yorkers learned of the British ceasefire in the American Revolution, effect effectively making the United States an independent country. Washington Irving has long been associated with the Hudson River Valley. In 1800, he took a trip up the Hudson River Valley to visit two of his elder sisters. He was one of 11 children, a very large family, in Johnstown, New York, which is right outside, right outside today's Albany, New York. This is when Irving became enchanted with the Hudson River Valley. He fell in love with the legends, the folklore in the valley. He became enraptured with Dutch history, Dutch culture, uh, Dutch, Dutch architecture, Dutch antiquities. And throughout his life, he would return to the Hudson Valley for intellectual and spiritual nourishment. In fact, his home, he ultimately made his home in the Hudson River Valley, right outside of Terrytown, New York, in a state called Sunnyside. And if you've never visited Sunnyside, I would recommend uh, putting on your to-do list. It's open until, I believe, uh, the first or second week, no week of November of this year, and then it'll re reopen next May. Irving belonged to the Romantic period of American literature. And the Romantic period of literature was a reaction to the Enlightenment period, which was steeped in neoclassical norms and was very strict in what you could and could not do as a writer, as a poet, and a playwright. The Romantics rejected that. And instead, they looked to nature, they looked to environment, they looked to history, they looked to folklore, they looked to emotional outpourings for content and for inspiration. And some of Irving's contemporaries and successors, I'm sure you've heard of, Edgar Allan Poe, who many of us read this time of year. Also, there's a Poe site in the Bronx, the Poe Cottage, I would suggest making a trip there. Herman Melville, Melville also a native New Yorker. Uh, Ralph, I mean, excuse me, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was in Salem, which is another Halloween-centric site. And um, James Fenmore Cooper, who in many ways was Irving's literary rival. Irving was the godfather of this romantic movement. He was the first internationally renowned American writer. There were other professional American writers before Irving. He was the first one to command an international audience. Critics and readers in the United States and across the Atlantic and Great Britain devoured Irving's works. Irving lived in Great Britain for 17 years 
in this period, this is where he composed most of the works which we read today, specifically The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. They were not written in the United States. It's interesting to note that. While he was living in Great Britain, he was a celebrity. Artists, writers, politicians, uh, men and women of high society all invited Irving to their parties, to their dinners, to their soirees. They wanted to meet Irving. They wanted to talk to Irving. They wanted to hear what he had to say. We don't have writers of that status today. So I would just like to throw out this question. You know, we're not going to talk about it necessarily, but what our society might be like if writers and artists were held in such high regard today. Irving has a deep and lasting influence on our culture in, in ways that are very subtle and very profound that I think many of us don't realize. First of all, language. The term almighty dollar comes from Washington Irving. He coined this term in his story, The Creole Village. Gotham, Gothamist, Gothamite are terms we use to describe New Yorkers. Those can come to us through Irving, which he coined in A History of New York, which was published in 1809. Culturally, especially concerning some of our holidays, we owe much to Irving. In Irving's lifetime, Christmas was dying out in the United States. Uh, in New England, it was never widely celebrated. In New York City, the premier holiday was New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. In fact, in certain parts, in certain cities, in certain states, Christmas had devolved to effectively drunken brawling. So there was a movement to ban Christmas in those areas. However, Ir Irving wrote a series of stories, or sketches as he would call them, depicting traditional English Christmases. So think of the many of the secular traditions we associate with Christmas, the songs, the food, the lights, the candles. Those come to us through Irving's writings. So what we think of Christmas today, in part, comes to us through Irving and later on Charles Dickens. Earlier this month, we celebrated Columbus Day. Today, you know, I think it's safe to say Columbus is a complicated figure. But in Irving's lifetime, Columbus was very important to Americans' understanding of their history and their culture. In the early years of the American public, American journalists, American thinkers, American writers, American politicians were attempting to shape a distinct American cultural identity and history, something separate from Great Britain. They looked to figures to populate that history, one of whom, one of who, excuse me, was Christopher Columbus. Irving penned a, a multi-volume biography of Columbus, which was widely successful and critically acclaimed both in the United States and Britain. It was deemed a literary success and a historical success. However, Irving could not resist inserting myths and tall tales in this biography. So I just want to ask everyone, uh, when you were in grade school in the United States, were you told that Columbus sailed across the ocean blue in 1492 to disprove the flat earth theory, right? The idea was, before Columbus sailed, we believed the world was flat. Well, that was never true. In 1492, any serious thinker believed the world was spherical. If you asked a the theologian, if you asked a philosopher, if you asked what they would call natural scientists, and you said, do you think the world is flat? They would say no. The concept of a spherical, spherical Earth goes back to ancient Greece. Any serious thinker, uh, whether it be Greek thinkers, Roman thinkers, Arabic thinkers, the sort of school of thought that build what we later call the, the European thinking and philosophy, all believed the world was spherical. However, Irving wrote this myth in his history of Columbus, and it's been passed down generation to generation as gospel. I know I was taught that he disproved the flat earth theory, but he did not. And on a final, Irving died in November of 1859. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So now to Irving's relationship with Jersey City, New Jersey, which, as I stated earlier, is a much deeper and richer, richer and I think more influential in Irving's writings than many of us uh, might uh, appreciate. So this home was the Kimball Mansion. In the first decade of the 1800s, Irving and his friends, who affectionately called themselves the Kilkenny Lads, would venture across the Hudson River, travel up Bergen Hill, which is right around the corner from us, to the Passaic River. This house was located in what today would be either the Woodside or Forest Hill neighborhoods of Newark. So who you ask might tell you it's a different neighborhood. It was owned by Irving's lifelong friend, Governor Kimball. And another lifelong friend of Irving, James Kirk Paulding, who went on to have his own successful career as an author and a playwright, and he was later sec Secretary of the Navy under President Martin Van Buren, wrote a poem called The Lay of the Scottish Phil. In the introductory stanza of that poem, 
He recounts how the Kilkenny lads would regularly cross the Hudson River and land in Jersey City, and he said Jersey City, ride co stagecoach up Bergen Hill on the way to Passaic. So I just want you to think of that and remember that as we get further into the discussion tonight, that we know in the 18, early 1800s, Irving and his friends traveled through Jersey City. Another fact about this home uh, in Irving and Paulding was that Irving and Paulding launched the Sal Magoody magazine in this house. The Sal Magoody magazine was Irving's first professional success as a writer. It was a satirical magazine that mocked New York society, mocked New York, New York life, and mocked people who were well known in New York City. I think a contemporary equivalent would be The Onion or even Mad Magazine. Okay, so this painting is a scene from Washington Irving's A History of New York, which was published in 1809. This marks the first time Washington Irving wrote about Communipaw, New Jersey. The first time that he wrote about Jersey City and New Jersey that we know of. A History of New York was a wild success. It was beloved in, in America. It was beloved in England. Sir Walter Scott, the poet and novelist, the creator of Ivanhoe, loved this work. Uh, he actually befriended Irving when Irving was in England, due in part to this work. Interesting facts about this illustration. This is from the painter John Kedor. Uh, Culture Affairs used an illustrate uh, painting from Kedor for the wonderful flyer they made for tonight's event. That, that painting, I believe, is entitled The Legend of the Headless Horseman. Kedor uh, died in obscurity. He lived the last years of his life in Jersey City, and he's buried in Bayview Cemetery in Jersey City. Only around a dozen or so of Kedor's work survive. Uh, a few are in the New York area. I know the Brooklyn Museum of Art owns several. I know one or two is in one of the houses owned by historic Hudson Valley, who manages Sunnyside. In 1942, the Brooklyn Art Museum put together an exhibit of Kedor's paintings, reintroducing Kedor to the American mu Museum going public. OK, we're getting closer to Gibbet Island. This gentleman is Martin Van Buren. Do we have any Seinfeld fans out there? So you remember the Van Buren boys? He was the founder of the street gang, the Van Buren boys, <laughs> that roughed at Kramer and, and George Costanza. Martin Van Buren was the eighth president of the United States from 1837 to 1841. He served as the vice president under Andrew Jackson. He had a long career in New York state politics and in diplomacy, and we could probably have a whole lecture on Martin Van Buren. Van Buren and Irving became friends when they were both stationed in the American ministry in Great Britain, so this would be the forerunner to the State Department. In the fall of 1833, we're back stateside, Irving and Van Buren embarked on what they called the Dutch Tour. This was a tour that began in Albany, New York, and concluded in Communipaw, New Jersey. Their goal of this tour was to visit villages and towns which still held Dutch character and had a Dutch you know, feel and flavor to it. They were looking to hear the Dutch language, to hear Dutch stories, to, to see Dutch arch architecture, to visit Dutch cemeteries, much like Old Bergen Cemetery down the, cemetery down the road. It's interesting to know that, note that the Buren was of Dutch descent. In fact, Dutch was his first language. He didn't actually speak English until he started grade school, making him the only American president for whom English was a second language. Also, this trip of 1833, I think, is very important in understanding the relationship between Irving and Jersey City. This is the only trip to Jersey City which Irving documented in his private letters and papers. This is the only visit to Jersey City that we know of, that we can prove without a doubt. And this image, I think, captures what Communipaw looked like in Irving's lifetime. And I think this also was reflected, excuse me, reflected in guests from Gibbet Island. So we're seeing a sleepy a fishing village with an agrarian backdrop, something very close to nature, something really foreign to anyone who lives in Jersey City today. And I think what Irving, Irving at his best, and what I think attracts people to Irving in part, is he captures and paints a picture of a, a pre-industrial, really a pre-modern America, a slower place, uh, a way of life that's closer to nature, that closer to the natural world, natural world uh, a world where mystery and magic still exists and still aren't that far away from us. <laughs> 
another uh, element or fact I'd like to point out is Irving visited, again, Irving visited Communion Pond in 1833. Guests from Gibbet Island was published in October of 1839. Ten years later, so the end of the 1840s, Communion Pond was becoming highly industrialized. So think the Morris Canal, think the Central Railroad of New Jersey, think slaughterhouses, think foundries. This world was about to fade away. And Irving's work really is a repository of this sort of world. All right. Excuse me. Communipa was very important, I think, to Irving. He continued to mine it throughout his career. So we know he wrote about it first in 1809. When he visited Communipa in 1833 with Martin Van Buren, they made a trip to this house. In 1839, Irving wrote a piece called Communipa. It was published in Knickerbocker Magazine, September of 1839. He rechristened this house the House of the Four Chimneys. So the middle structure you see has four chimneys. This was the original Dutch farmhouse. The other two were add-ons. When Irving and Van Buren paid a visit, they paid homage to the patriarch of the Van Horn family. Uh, Irving made a note of this in his journal, so it carried some importance to him. The Van Horn patriarch, I believe his name was Jacob, but don't quote me on this. He, re he recounted both Irving and Van Buren standing on the Jersey side of the Hudson River as a young man and watching Trinity, Bur Tw excuse me, Trinity Church burn in Manhattan in the Great Fire of 1776. This fire destroyed hundreds of buildings, left thousands homeless, right as the American Revolution was about to begin. All right, the main event, the guests from Gibbet Island. So I'd like to thank Charles for setting this picture my way. This is from a blog published by the Firestone Library of Princeton University, where they actually hold this manuscript. This is an unpublished edition of the guests of, from Gibbet Island by Charles Greenbush. He actually created this as a teenager, so I guess that's a, a bit humbling. He went on to have a very successful career as a magazine and newspaper illustrator in New York. He worked, I believe, for The Sun and uh, Harper's. The guests from Gibbet Island is an obscure story. And we're going to speculate a little bit why that might be. A few years ago, I attended an event at the Center for Fiction in Manhattan, commemorating a new edition of Irving's works by Penguin Classics. It was a great event. There was a dramatic reading, not as good as the one we heard tonight, <laughs> of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and then a discussion with, I believe, some editors and some writers about Irving and his influence and impact as an American author. That book does not contain this story. As I've been working on this project, whenever I've stopped at a bookstore, whenever I've stopped at a library, I've sought out a compilation of Irving's works. Without a doubt, I've yet to find this story in any of those collections. Now, why is that? Well, one, I think uh, some of the, the racial language, some of the racial stereotypes that Irving uses, which were acceptable in his time, let's, let's be honest and be frank about that, make an audience uncomfortable. And it certainly makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to teach. That may be part of it. Uh, I, my opinion, honestly, is that this story was not that important to Irving. This was published in 1839. However, it was harvested from notes from much earlier in Irving's career. It was published in a compilation in 1849 entitled Book of the Hudson. At that time, Irving was working on a biography of Oliver Goldsmith. A playwright, and bio, uh, a playwright and a novelist. It was published a final time in Irving's lifetime in 1855 in a book entitled Wolfert's, Wolfert's Roost. At that time, Irving was working on a multi-volume biography of George Washington. So this story was not demanding or commanding his intellectual, his creative, or even his professional priorities. And in Irving's letters, in Irving's journals, there's no mention of this story. So it wasn't a priority for him. It wasn't something he was pushing. It wasn't something he was marketing. And the two compilations or collections I mentioned, Book of the Hudson and Wolfert's Roost, were published in an attempt for Irving as publishers to make money. And that's fine. That's, authors do that all the time. However, I think this is a decent story. And I think this is a story worth rediscovering, which I, I'm hoping you know, we're proving this evening. And why is that? One as we discussed when we were talking about Communipaw, I think this story offers us 
really a, a, an ability to step back in time to a different time, a different period, a different area of Jersey City history. When Jersey City and its citizens lived a little more closer to nature, uh, the story contained anecdotes of Bluto going fishing, going crabbing, harvesting oyster beds. And that might seem you know, mind-blowing to us that you could just step out your door and go fishing. I mean, I mean, people fish in the Hudson River, but they shouldn't be eating anything they pull out of the Hudson River. Uh, another element that jumps out to me and is extremely important for this time of year is this is a classic ghost story. In 1966, a scholar by the name of Oral Code published an article entitled Jersey Gothic. And Jersey Gothic was an exhaustive list, and I mean exhaustive, of every play, uh, story, novel set in New Jersey that he classified as a Gothic story. And he presented several elements which made a story Jersey Gothic, several of which the guests, of Gib guests from Gibbet Island embody, one being landscapes, which we already talked about, pirates, which were clearly seminal to the story, and ghosts in the supernatural. So this is a quality ghost story, and it meets the scholarly criteria, I guess, of Jersey Gothic. Um, just to step back a few points, I mentioned earlier this was an obscure story. There's very little scholarship on this story. I found two articles, two. And I, I, I work for university. I am a librarian by training. I have access to expansive resources. So I know how to hunt down scholarly articles, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, one of the articles, it was just kind of cast off, saying Irving wrote this story. So it's not something that's been analyzed deeply by scholars and authors. The last reason I think this story is worth rediscovering and appreciating is I think it highlights New Jersey cities and New Jersey's contribution to our shared American cultural heritage. This, I think many residents of Jersey City, many residents of Garden State don't appreciate how rich and why New Jersey's contribution to letters and the arts in America has been. I mean, if you talk to Americans, they probably think New Jersey's what? The Parkway, the Jersey Shore, and the Sopranos. <laughs> and I think guests from Gibbet Island disproves that. To conclude, I just want to speak about a There's two places depicted and important to this story. So what I meant to ask when I started, and I forgot, was does anyone know where Gibbet Island is today? Ellis Island. Ellis Island. Yes. So in Irving's adult lifetime, Ellis Island, which was actually owned by a gentleman named Samuel Ellis in the 18th century, was known as Gibbet Island. And why is that? This, in Irving's lifetime, was federal property. A criminal convicted of crimes on the high seas, piracy, which we heard about in the guests, mutiny, etc., earned a death penalty. Crimes on the high seas carried the death penalty. Being a federal crime, the executions would occur on federal property. A gibbet is the wooden structure from which a hangs man's noose is held. In Irving's lifetime, public execution resembled what is what exactly portrayed in guests from Gibbet Island. A criminal would be hanged until they were dead and left to decay in public view for a period of undisclosed time. Why was that? It was seen as a deterrent on crime. That may seem gruesome to us today, but that was the practice. I'm sure there are th elements of uh, peniology we might, we might think of as natural today. 20 years from now, someone will look back and say, hey, why were they doing this? But public execution and decay was the mainstay. A few facts um, germane to the story about Ellis Island or Gibbet Island are one, the last public ex execution held in Gibbet Island was in June of 1839, a few months before Irving wrote in Knickerbocker Magazine published his story. I suspect this was the impetus for Irving to rush finishing the story and the rush for Knickerbocker magazine to publish it. The name Gibbet Island would have been fresh in readers' minds. Ten years later, the name might not mean anything. Also, in an American passage by the historian Vincent Conato, and this is a history of Ellis Island, he points out that there was an inordinate amount of free slaves, escaped slaves, and rebellious slaves executed here. And this may explain why Irving created the character of Pluto. Because again, this would resonate with the reading public. 
final sort of footnote about Gibbet Island. So as I mentioned, in Irving's lifetime, it was known as Gibbet Island. However, that was not the case at the time of the story setting. This island was known as Little Oyster Island at the time of the guests from Gibbet Island. So here we see Irving playing a bit of fast and loose with the facts, where if fiction or made a better story, he would jettison the facts, which may explain Columbus's flat earth theory as well. <laughs> It's all right. Yeah. All right. So the story partially concluded with Van der Scamp being buried in a quiet Dutch church. Does anyone know where that church is today? Old Bergen Church. Old Bergen church. He was buried, or the fictional character was buried here in Old Bergen Cemetery. Um, I had the, the pleasure of visiting Old Bergen Cemetery early, earlier this year. If you have an opportunity, I would recommend doing it. Um, Reverend John Brown of the Old, Old Bergen Church preside over the tour. So again, if you have that opportunity, take it. It's a very interesting place, fascinating place. Old Bergen is effectively ground zero for the local tales and stories surrounding Washington Irving and Jersey City. I'm not necessarily going to attempt to disprove or prop up those stories. But what I would like to say, or what I want to point out, is what do we do know about Irving and Jersey City? We do know that in the first decade, Irving and the Kilkenny lads would travel across the Hudson River, land in Jersey City, travel up Bergen Hill. It's possible, more likely probable, that they passed by the cemetery in the old Bergen church. Second, we know in 1833, and we know this for a fact, that Van Washington Irving in the company of Martin Van Buren, conducted their Dutch tour. That concluded in Communipaw. Considering it was called the Dutch tour, and they were seeking out Dutch antiquities, Dutch sort of archaeological uh, mainstays or artifacts, I would be shocked if they had not made a stop at Old Bergen Cemetery in Old Bergen Church. The last fact I'd like to share is a quote from a book published in 1994. This was from an author by Janice Cole Serapin, and the book was entitled Old Burial Grounds of New Jersey. Quote, Irving was a frequent visitor to Bergen. It was an acquaintance of the Van Winkle family, end quote. And notice the name on that, Tombstone Van Winkle. Unfortunately, I've yet to find anything to corroborate that statement. This book does not contain a footnote, does not contain a citation. Now, that doesn't mean it's true. That doesn't mean it's not fiction. And being Halloween season, I'm not certain that's important. Myths, tales are important to locality, important to our shared cultural identity. I hope you enjoyed the reading this evening. I hope you enjoyed my introduction to Washington Irving. And if you did, I hope that you go visit the Jersey City Public Library or your local bookstore, pick up a, work, uh, pick up a collection of Irving's works, and discover a story that you've never read before. Thank you so much. <laughs>